This is another iRaw podcast. I think we've we've come a very long way with human rights, and now I think it's really the time to think beyond human rights. And we've seen how human rights have changed over the decades, and I think now is the time to to also extend basically that this rights language and also the recognition and the entitlement to to all living beings. And it's really important to recognize that human rights have also never kind of stayed the same. They have also developed. And now is the time really for rights of nature and animal rights to develop. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Animal Tone. Straight away, I want to say I'm sorry that the second half of the season has been coming out in such irregular kind of fashion. It was my hope that I would be releasing one episode a week and we kind of came out strong with that at the end of last year. But as we approached Christmas and yeah, things just slowly started to fall apart a little bit in that way. So I'm very sorry about that and that these episodes have been coming out in slightly irregular fashion. Myself and Christian are going to talk a little bit about how we can restructure things so that when I release a season, the episodes will be coming out in more regular fashion. And that's probably going to mean recording and editing everything and making sure it's completely done before we release the very first episode of season seven. So myself and Christian are going to start thinking and talking a bit about that, but we are making good progress nonetheless. I'm very delighted that today is the ninth episode of season six, where we're focusing on animals and politics. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about international relations, which I think has come up a fair bit so far in the season already. But, you know, in general, I think we've realized that we talk about politics at a range of different scales whether that's politics in the home, politics in a municipality, but also politics at an international level and scale. It definitely impacts animals in a variety of ways, and animals experience kind of politics and policies at different scales. So today we're going to be talking all about international relations, and my guest is definitely an expert in that regard. Today I'm going to be talking to Andrea Schapper, who is a professor in international politics at the University of Stirling. In September and October 2022, she was a guest scholar at Royal Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law in Lund University, Sweden. Andrea has had a whole host of experiences, a wide range of universities across Europe. Her PhD is from Bremen International Graduate School of Social Sciences, and she's previously studied at Cornell University, uh, Lipnitz Universität Hanover, and the United Nations Office at Geneva. Andrea has worked for international organizations like the International Labour Organization and non-governmental organizations such as the National Domestic Workers Movement in India or the Frederick Ebert Foundation in Zambia. She has conducted field research in Bangladesh, India, Ethiopia, and Zambia. Her research focuses on environmental justice and on new developments at the intersection of human rights and the environment, including new forms of institutional interactions and actor constellations. And you're going to see this a lot happening in our conversation today. She's kind of thinking a lot about how international organizations operate, and she's increasingly thinking about how animal uh, animal rights and the rights of nature can be better incorporated into these international bodies and institutions. So I hope you enjoy. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the Animal Time Podcast. Hi. It's great to have you on the show. I saw in your description that you've worked at Lund University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there last year at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law and also at the Institute of Political Science. So that was some, I was there as a guest scholar. Amazing. It's a great campus. I did my master's degree there and I absolutely love, love, love Lund University. So like that jumped, I know your, 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 like the description of the things you've done, you've been to so many places and done such incredible things. But when I saw Lund University, I was like, yay, Lund. So it's just really fun to have someone on the show who who has been on the campus. So welcome to the show. This is the final interview in a series of 10. So next up, we're going to have the grad review. And in this final episode, we're focusing on international relations, which is going to be quite, I think, fascinating for thinking about animals 
maybe as a bit of a recap for you, but also for listeners, so far in the, the season, we've, you know, we've gone from kind of really intimate kind of politics to thinking about violence, you know, as well as institutional violence, to everything from cosmopolitanism to political rights to advocacy, feminism, photojournalism. We've really covered a whole range of ways in which you can think about politics. But I think this international level brings a whole different dimension to thinking about politics. So I'm really excited to get into it. But before we do, let's learn a little bit about you. How did you get involved in thinking about international politics and international relations? Okay, yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Claudia, for for, for inviting me here. I actually started with international relations really early. So when I started my studies at the University of Hanover, and I had actually selected the, the course I was studying, social sciences, because it had a focus or specialism on international relations. And I was really interested in, you know, questions of cooperation and conflict. How can we bring different nations together together? How do we find common solutions? You know, how do we actually acknowledge a different context, diversity, and then at the same time also cooperate? So these were the questions that I was really interested in when, when I started studying. And this is basically when I started my journey with international relations too. Wow. I, I remember, so my, my undergrad was in journalism and then my fourth year I switched to political science and I remember international political economy just really grabbing you know that the idea of geopolitics just seemed so interesting and fascinating and, and that's there are all of these different global connections that really do determine our day-to-day -day lives in pretty profound ways so you start your kind of journey with international relations and international politics at what point do animals start to come into the frame for you in thinking through these ideas Relatively late in the process, I would say, because first I was mainly interested in human rights, so in the in the more anthropocentric view of rights, I would say, and that was fostered. I think that interest was fostered by internships that I did in in India and in Zambia, where I worked on the elimination of child labor and children's rights. So I. I had a very keen interest in children's rights and I did my PhD on children's rights as well. And for my PhD, for example, I did a big case study on Bangladesh. And in Bangladesh, I saw how rights can actually not be realized due to certain environmental challenges. So climate change, for example. So yeah, to give you a very concrete example, if you look at the right to education, you you need a certain infrastructure, right? You need to build schools. And in Bangladesh, there, the, the, I mean, the challenges that local communities face because of climate change are tremendous. And if they, if they build a school, the next flooding may, may come and, and the school may be gone. So I realized that there is a strong connection between environmental challenges and, and human rights. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that what we do to protect nature is not enough and to really redefine the relationship between humans and nature. So to really live in a sustainable way, we also need other forms of rights, rights of nature, animal rights. And it was, I think, very late in, in, in my career that I started thinking about rights of nature and animal rights. And that was when I was studying at the University of Stirling already. And when I was yeah, working more and more on the environment, on environmental challenges, also working from an interdisciplinary perspective. So working a lot with natural scientists and the, all these conversations really made me think that we need to be actually much more radical in our thinking if we want to protect the environment. Have you found that in looking at these policies that do protect the environment, that they are inclusive of animals or, or is nature kind of treated as a general abstract thing? Yes. So I, I think that there is more and more rhetoric of, you know, protecting the environment and also rights of nature and 
not necessarily animal rights, but animal welfare. But I don't think that what, I mean, there, there is a certain rhetoric, but what we see in practice is certainly not radical enough. And it's, it's not, it's simply not enough for, for living in harmony with nature. That's a term that, that is often brought up at the United Nations. It's, it's not enough for that. And it's in the policies that we have there, there are reforms that suggest that we need to protect the environment in a better way, but our thinking is still very much anthropocentric, very much human centered. And I, I don't think that the current policies that we have are actually adequately protecting animals and nature. That's really interesting. Maybe before we dive into some of these specific policies and the work they do, we can take a, a bit of a step back and first just actually say, what is international relations? Before we start to bring in you know, animals and, and the various policies, it might just be good to have a sense of what you mean when we say international relations. Yeah, that's a really good question because the classic term, international relations, how we use it here, is basically means if you go back to the Latin meaning, it, it means between nations. So inter means between between nations. And that was also the original meaning. So what are the relations between nations and how can we make them peaceful and cooperative? But this has changed and the discipline has changed over the years. And international relations are much more than international now. They also include other actors. And this started with non-governmental actors, for example, but also multinational corporations. They would all try to influence international relations today. And one of my arguments is that now in the face of environmental challenges, we should also consider that there are other actors. Maybe the environment is also an actor that we need to consider in international relations. But just to say that this term international relations is quite old and it does not reflect what we actually mean when we say it, you know. So a, a, a more adequate term would probably be something like global politics or, yeah, just recognizing that all these different forms of actors that nowadays try, try to shape politics beyond borders okay so so the whole inter inter relations would as you say have, have implied a relationship between nation nation or various nations literally in between nations but now there are a whole host of different actors including like you said multinational organizations and that would include i'm guessing like the world bank the un but i'm assuming also here big actors are also large multinational companies that are doing huge work. So are these, when we're speaking about politics here happening and we're talking about policies, to go back to what we were previously discussing, are you talking now about policies that are operating at a global scale or are we talking about policies that are, you know, made at the national scale or made within companies but that have global implications? Yeah, I'm mainly talking about politics that or policies that are or even agreements, international agreements that are made at the international level and that then trickle down to the national or even local level. So I'm mainly talking about the policies that are agreed on an international scale. So something I found quite interesting about your paper when you were talking about the sustainable development goals, for example, was you mentioned there that there's actually very little work that's been done with regards to translating things like animal welfare and animal rights into international policies? Yeah, there's very little. And especially when you look at the more radical concept of animal rights. So there are few attempts to have animal rights at an international scale. There was an attempt to have a universal declaration of animal rights. And that was also actually pronounced, but this was mainly by non-governmental organizations and the states never did that. They States or state governments, representative of states, state governments mainly concentrated on animal welfare, which means actually improving the conditions under which animals 
live and are used by humans, but it's not a radical rethinking of the relationship between human beings and animals. So it still means that humans can use animals, but under improved conditions. So there's there's a huge difference, I would say, between animal welfare and animal rights. And animal welfare is what is... Uh, there are some attempts to kind of protect and improve animal welfare at the United Nations, but there is hardly any attempt to really protect animal rights at the United Nations. When did negotiations happen around that potential declaration of animal rights? That's a long time ago. That was in 1978, but the states never really took this up. So it was mainly non-governmental organizations, conservation organizations, animal rights organizations that want to bring this Uh, yeah, wanted to see this as part of the agenda of the United Nations, but the states were never willing to actually take this up and to support this idea. And I mean, going going to the maybe legal terms a little bit, a declaration is not legally binding. So a declaration would basically just be a signal that the states agree to protecting animal rights, and not even that was achieved at the United Nations. So they couldn't even agree on basically agreeing to this without being legally bound by any decision. So this was this was unsuccessful. And since then, the focus has very much been on animal welfare, which, yeah, like I said, which means to, to kind of improve the conditions under which we basically... Yeah, for example, farm animals or, yeah, have have use animals, yeah. So which, in the kind of like international architecture and, and organizations, which organizations are kind of in charge of these animal welfare policies and practices? So there is no, not really an organization at the UN level that is explicitly there to only protect animal welfare or animal health or animal rights. There is there is the UN Environmental Program, UNEP. And UNEP has, for example, last year they've they've made an attempt to 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 foster the animal welfare agenda a little bit because they said they 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 adopted a new resolution which makes reference to animal welfare environment and sustainable development and they say basically we we need to look at kind of the 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 relationship between those three if we if if we want to move forward with our sustainable development agenda but it's it's really interesting that the UN has never really engaged with animals or animal rights or animal welfare so i think this is also in the in the paper that we've written in this article on animal rights in international relations so one suggestion that we make is that such an organization is actually established at the united nations recognizing really the interrelatedness between humans animals and and nature and to kind of really move forward with the sustainability agenda by recognizing that we need this as a forum. So international organizations can be understood as a forum to bring states together to discuss there, but also as an actor to actually implement, let's say, specific programs, specific policies on animal rights and animal welfare and i would look at it from these two perspectives as well we need we need a forum for this and we also need an actor that protects animal rights and animal welfare at the international level yeah it's it's rather remarkable when you realize how little animals feature in these even though you know climate change sustainability environmental protection all of these things have been discussed for for decades and decades now but surprisingly animals and their interests feature very mildly in these organizations and in the policies they create and when they are included i think they're done in a in a pretty abstract way, in a way that doesn't really grapple with what animals need in order for them to have sustainable lives or even just to have lives. So it's it's pretty remarkable, I think, 
that that because I think so many of us assume, you know, you, you conservation has been going on for so long, and we think, oh, conservation is working in the interests of animals, and you know, the UN is looking after everyone and everything, but really, animals are quite absent. So this idea of an institution and an international institution that is dedicated to putting forward policy that acts on the for the interests of animals, I think, is really quite interesting. But talking about the sustainable development goals, there, your paper. I thought it was quite fascinating in how you said that the lack of consideration for animal rights, so animal welfare does come up somewhat in those goals, but the lack of consideration for animal rights is not only a gap in the sustainable development goals, but can actually be a hindrance to achieving those goals. What did you mean by that? What we meant by that was that if if you look at the 17 goals, they're all very different. And we only have two goals that relate to animals in a certain way. And that's goal 14, life below water, and goal 15, life on land. But in practice, we can very often see that goals can can also conflict with one another. And that those those SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that are more anthropocentric are very often prioritized and we give that example of renewable energy projects and for example hydroelectric dams and we've chosen hydroelectric dams because i did some field research on hydroelectric dams so i've I've seen them basically in the field and i've interviewed people and i mean if we take this as an example, I can give you one example from my research. That's the Giba 3 hydroelectric dam in Ethiopia. So it's basically a renewable energy project. And Ethiopia is using its hydro resources, water, to produce more energy and to really push its own development. So it's very, it's a very ambitious has a very ambitious development agenda and green economy strategy. So it wants to become a middle income country by 2025. So it produces lots of hydro energy and sells that to neighboring countries. So it's a big push in terms of economic development. But if you look at the local situation, because the water is being dammed the river where it's being dammed in the Giba 3 project it's called River Omo and along the River Omo so first of all the the water quality and water quantity is substantially reduced in the river because of the damming of the water and then along the river there was a very rich biodiversity that indigenous peoples used as grazing lands for agriculture and so on there, there was there were specific fish species in the river and so on. And this is all being destroyed. So it has very severe adverse biodiversity effects. So if we translate this into the SDG language, we can say that um, so this is basically if we look at specific sustainable development goals, we can say that we have a goal that is called climate action. We have a goal that is, that's goal 13. We have a goal, affordable and clean energy. And we have a goal, industry, innovation and infrastructure or decent work and economic growth. It fosters all these goals. But at the same time, it it has an adverse effect on life below water, life on land. It also doesn't reduce inequalities, but it actually increases inequalities but it's very often those anthropocentric goals that are prioritized in certain projects or policy programs that you then put into practice. And those goals that are you know, meant to protect biodiversity, th- these goals are very often neglected because the, the economic growth is still kind of prioritized in, in certain development programs. And if you look at the situation of individual animals, you can see that that they are also adversely affected by this dam project. So it's the SDGs in the end are anthropocentric goals. They mainly focus on human development, but not necessarily on, I would say, a holistic understanding of sustainable development, which would include animals and nature as well. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's come up a couple of times in the podcast. The, and I remember this from my early days in political science was, you know, sustainable development had those classic three pillars, economics, environment, and the social, right? Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it felt as though economics was always the pillar that got the strongest leaning and it was used as a way of kind of in service of the social and the environment. So as long as you were making money and helping equality or making money and helping the environment, then you were doing fine. But if you were helping the environment and doing something social but not making money, that was never really on the agenda. Money always it felt as though sustainability ended up becoming a, a euphemism for making money in a in a in a more palatable way kind of yeah i absolutely agree there there is and some would even say you know that these three pillars are irreconcilable but that it's i don't know it's i can definitely see that the solutions that we have found so far are are not transformative in any way because we keep reproducing these inequalities between humans and nature and animals so there, there's no transformative change that we can observe and we can also not see that at, at the united nations but i think that's where your kind of proposal of having a more holistic at the very least so it's not to say that we're necessarily saying no damming project should happen or no renewable energy project should happen, but that before such policies are implemented, there is certainly a need to not only do a, like a cursory environmental assessment, but to really think substantially about how this new infrastructure would impact the environments and the communities, and, and not just human communities, the multi-species communities that are in that, that vicinity. You know, like I know you mentioned the dam in Ethiopia, but and I love renewable energy. I think renewable energy is very exciting, but you don't think about the infrastructure that's needed. So I know with these solar farms now, there's a lot of concern around how solar farms are entering previously untouched, quote unquote, untouched environments that were relatively left alone because we were quite concentrated in cities, but now kilometers and kilometers of desert space and untouched and, and pretty delicate and vulnerable environments are being used as solar farms that are having pretty negative impacts on animals that live in, in those niche environments. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think one mistake that has also been made in the past is that we focus on large scale projects. And I think sometimes a smaller community owned project would projects would probably be more sustainable because you would also have a better overview of the adverse effects. And you mentioned the environmental and social impact assessments. I mean that has to happen prior to kind of most projects being implemented. It also depends on the national legislation here and and then on the funder. So who's the funder? Does the funder have any requirements as well? Like the World Bank, for example, has economic and social safeguard policies. These are also kind of environmental and social impact assessments that need to be carried out. In our paper, we, we, we have another kind of more radical idea and we propose that if such projects are implemented we don't even we don't only need environmental and social impact assessments and consultations with those human beings that are affected but we need so to speak we need procedure rights so we need consultations with the environment as well and we need to consider the environment as an actor here who has an active voice in the decision-making processes. And what we mean is to have the environment represented by scientific experts and by legal guardians who make different decisions or who make decisions for the environment, but really from the perspective of the environment and who are part of such consultations, meaning that they could also say no, the impact on the environment is too too serious and it's not responsible to do it in that way. So we propose certain amendments to the project or we propose that the project is not being implemented. Do you ever wonder that this might lead to kind of not only conflicts in terms of thinking about which animal interests we're talking about, but 
conflicts in terms of the developed and developing world agendas? Because I imagine that a lot of developing countries would say, listen, developed developed cities and developed countries are largely responsible for the environmental disaster that we're currently in. And they had, you know, the industrial revolution, they polluted, we're still dealing with the effects of that pollution, but they are continue to reap the rewards of that development today, economically, and in terms of the infrastructure they have. But now we're reaching a time where everyone's saying, well, what you have to do has to be environmentally sustainable, and you have to think about all of the animals. And that countries who want to develop infrastructure and and programs that help them quote unquote develop are now being expected to jump through hoops that were not here historically and are being expected to perform in a very unequal way. I absolutely understand the argument and the historic injustice and historic responsibilities are there. The problem is that the way these projects like the renewable energy projects for example are implemented now is that's also causing conflict and it's causing conflict between governments who follow a very restrictive development path sometimes and local communities and the environment so these are also conflicts and so this is all causing conflicts already and i also take conflicts between the government and then society and the environment very seriously. And this this dam project that I was talking about, the Giba 3 dam project, has actually led to a lot of conflict in, in Ethiopia between the government and local indigenous communities, but also between the government and then people in Kenya because the, this river that was dammed, actually also the damming of the river had an impact on Lake Turkana in, in Kenya where the water flows into and the water quality and quantity was was adversely affected there too. So the conflicts, I would say, are already there. I think there are the historic responsibilities that you've mentioned as well, and I absolutely see that. It's a very important point. But this means then to basically find ways to cooperate that would help everyone design projects that mitigate conflicts. Also the conflicts between state, society and the environment. And 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 this means that the developed world also has has a role to play here in, you know, providing the funds, perhaps the expertise, but in a way that it leaves opportunity for all affected actors actually to participate and to have a say. So we need to think about what are the appropriate development projects in in our times. But the conflicts are there already. Yeah, it sounds like we need to reconfigure what we think of as even a developed country, because even even the language of developed and developing is so centered on economic development as opposed to, I think it's Brunei that uses the happiness index instead to kind of measure their their performance and maybe it's these very metrics that we use by which to measure whether a society is developed or not need to to change pretty dramatically so you mentioned that you put forward at least two kind of proposals for how animals and animal rights could be better incorporated into international relations the one is to have an international organization perhaps under the banner of the UN, that's directly focused on animals' interests and animal rights. And the second is that when carrying out any sort of large-scale projects, that not only must human communities be consulted, but animal and environmental communities must also be consulted. And then this could be done through experts. Do you have any other kind of suggestions or thoughts on how animals could be in in a really practical way, included in international regulations? So in this paper on animal rights, the United Nations, we actually make four suggestions on how animal rights could be strengthened within the framework of the UN and also the UN sustainability agenda. And the first one was to, to create this new UN organization which is a forum for animal protection, so bring states together to discuss, but it's also an actor for animal protection in that it would 
implement animal protection, animal rights and animal protection policies. The second proposition is to include a new sustainable development goal on, on animal rights into the sustainability agenda. This is basically a suggestion that was brought forward by Ingrid Visserin Hamager. She is a professor in environmental politics and governance at Radboud University in Nijmegen in, in the Netherlands. So we take up that suggestion and we kind of say, yeah, we, we are actually supporting this idea. And then the third suggestion is to integrate animal rights instruments and rights of nature legislation because there we actually have a rights of nature legislation in individual countries but also at the United Nations and that that is actually much more advanced than than any legal instruments that we have that would protect animal rights so we propose to strengthen animal rights within that rights of nature legislation and the fourth recommendation was to to have these procedure rights so to have consultations with the environment and consider the environment as an actor it's it's quite fascinating i think also to see who the leaders are because there are some i think examples of countries that are taking the lead with regards to taking animal rights at the international level more seriously. And when it came to these rights of nature, it seems very much like it's Latin Latin America. I think Ecuador in particular, that's, if I'm not mistaken, leather, I'm getting, there was another one, another country, I think just two months ago or something that... Bolivia. Yes, exactly, exactly. Which has had pretty significant impacts for, I think, leatherback turtles and a whole host of animals because these have been implemented. And then I think you also mentioned in the paper that the African Union has been really taking the lead with thinking about animals and international relations. Yeah. So we have the rights of nature in... We have actually a UN World Charter for nature, which, which is the first kind of environmental instrument that that recognizes the need for, for harmony with nature, which is now very often also used by the United Nations, so that we need to live in harmony with nature if we want to live in a sustainable, more sustainable way. Then in 2008, we had rights of nature in the constitution of Ecuador, and then one year later, we had rights of nature in the in the constitution of Bolivia what's really interesting with the latin american countries is that they take this really seriously so they have it in their constitution and we also have first court decisions that have prioritized protection of nature over infrastructure projects development projects and so on so they take this very seriously and if you have that legal instrument and if it's taken seriously, you can have the court decisions that actually prevent certain projects that would harm nature or harm animals from being, being implemented. And I think that is really important to not only see that in the constitutions, but also see it in the decision making. So we can definitely see an effect here already. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really amazing to see. And I think it's such a such an important example because it's not only rhetoric in these countries they actually live that and i would hope that other countries could kind of go down this path as well because i think this 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 is a very good way also i mean of having courts protecting nature protecting the environment protecting animals but it also leads to an awareness raising among among populations, you know, because these court decisions, they are then widely just discussed and they're important precedent cases. And people really look at this and it's it's becoming part of yeah, it's it's the yeah, awareness is being raised in that way. And I think that is really relevant and really, really important. I think it's a really good example of just how countries can do things differently when there's when there's a political will you know so often I think and 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 I think it's something is significant about it also being countries in the global south that are taking the lead and taking the charge here and saying that this is important for our future and for our development 
because I think the effects of things like urbanization and of infrastructure development are having dramatic impacts on how people live, but also how environments uh, can cope and survive. So as we continue on this trajectory, these types of policies and court decisions are becoming more and more important. I had one more question before we before we go to your quotes. So we've we've spoken a fair bit now about the United Nations and about the Sustainable Development Goals, but these are just this is just one organization and I think one kind of set of policies and a whole landscape of international organizations and international politics. Would you advocate for, you know, would you want I guess, you know, at, at institutions like the World Bank or at blocks like the European Union or the African Union, would you also be putting forward an idea that each of these kinds of large international groups and organizations need to have an arm that is advocating for animal rights? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, the the World Bank, definitely, because, I mean, first of all, that they are actually part of the UN system, but they have a lot of power because they give out loans and they can, you know, substantially influence what is being implemented in in certain countries via the loan conditions. And here, for example, we if if we had animal rights mainstreamed into their agenda, I think we can see many effects. So if we take up our proposition to have these procedure rights for for animals as a condition for giving a World Bank loan, then then countries would have to do that if they want to implement a, a project with World Bank funding. Then they would, for example, have to consult nature animals and consider them as actors that have a say in the decision making process. So if we had that, I think that that would be quite powerful because the world bank is part of the united nations we have mainly focus on the on the un here but i think your idea of strengthen animal rights in regional organizations like the african union or the european union is is, is a very good one and there there's lots of potential here too but i think in the case of the european union there are many developments in terms of animal welfare, and there's very little done on animal rights. And that is why that is because animals are animal and you know animals, animal farming, animal agriculture, that this is all an important part of the EU's economy, and it's very much protected. So this means ethically speaking, we we are rather following and animal welfare approach here, but definitely not an animal rights approach where we see animals on, you know, an equal standing with human beings or animals not being used anymore. And the EU is, it's actually quite far away from that, but it would be quite powerful if we would see more on animal rights in, in the, in the EU. But what we can see is a strengthening of, of animal welfare and, there was a big EU conference last summer about animal welfare. There are also some 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 parties that are very engaged in that, but we won't see any radical ideas in the European Union on on animal rights. Yeah, when I when I spoke to Gary Francio, and he he pretty much said, you know, animal welfare. When you're having the conversation about animal welfare and how to use animals well instead of not use animals you're undermining many of it it's a completely it washes out the kind of conversation about animal rights when you have a, a conversation that's primarily centered on animal welfare but i do think that these regional blocks have a lot to offer in terms of thinking through animal rights and how they could be operationalized you know going back to your example with the dam in ethiopia you mentioned how this implicated animals and environments in kenya as well and i think especially considering and in the african continent in particular how animals move across boundaries and borders and they their their mobilities across borders points to me to need to have legislation that speaks across these boundaries as well and perhaps it is covered in some conservation policies but i know for example Botswana quite famously had a ban on 
hunting elephants, and that was recently lifted not too long ago. And elephants from neighboring countries had actually found sanctuary in Botswana. They realized that their numbers in Botswana were increasing uh, pretty dramatically. But when the ban was lifted, this raised a whole host of different questions about elephants' mobility. And I could see here how this should be an African Union debate and discussion about their diversity on the continent, about protecting a variety of wildlife, and and yeah, having regional blocks discuss these animals, I think, is really important. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And that's a strong argument also about the transboundary movement of, of animals that is certainly very relevant in general when it when it comes to nature. Yeah, I don't see a radical move from the African Union either. And here, the, the reason, I mean, there are also economic reasons for that. And I mean, that could actually be an explanation why we don't see so much action from the from the regional organizations, because the the main purpose of regional organizations is, is often economic integration. So they, they start coming together for economic purposes. And that was the main reason why they were founded. And then, you know, the other political regulations basically followed the the economic integration. And I think, I mean, coming back to the UN, the UN is a little bit different. It's not only focused on economic development. And I think if we really want to, in the long run, if we really want to follow this objective of living in harmony with nature and also of living peacefully with nature and with animals and in a sustainable environment, I think we need more radical ideas probably from that level. And then hopefully the regional organizations would follow path. But I, I do see that the that the United Nations, if you look at the objectives of and the purpose of the United Nations, that they have a role to play here. And it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how little is coming from, from the UN level and there could be so much more, but it's, again, you see that it's not, it's not a priority of the state actors that make international relations or, of the you know big multinational corporations that try to influence multinational or international relations it does seem to be getting some traction i think with the world health organization at least i think maybe largely facilitated by the the pandemic of course i think and and one one health kind of gaining popularity where it seems like the world health organization is having these conversations, but even then watching their debates, the one challenge I think that happens at these international levels is because there is so much concession, because things are so big, because you need so many actors to agree, achieving anything radical starts to seem really, really difficult. Yeah, you're right about the One Health approach, but I think that is also mainly pushed by the danger of zoonotic diseases. And yes, in the face of the pandemic and other forms of zoonotic diseases and the risks that are there for humans. It's again, I think it's a very anthropocentric thinking, a very human centered thinking again. So if we can see an effect on humans, then we also need to change the change the approach. But you're right. I mean, that's, it, it will be interesting to kind of follow up on on the One Health approach, which at least, you know, takes this relationship between humans and the environment and, yeah, also the, the global health risks into account. And I think at the, at the very least, unlike the Sustainable Development Goals, it is quite explicit about animals. It's not just environment. Animals aren't usurped into it. But I think even then, it's animals in perhaps quite a an instrumental view, animals as used in agriculture and animals at the, the interface of human human animal relations, which again is often in places of use, right? Like wet markets or or slaughterhouses, etc. But Andrea, before I before I take up all your time, <laughs> do you have a do you have a quote ready? And could you tell me what, what made you choose this quote? Yeah, so the quote I've chosen is it's actually one of the kind of operative uh, clauses from the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. And that declaration was proclaimed in, in 2010. And there was kind of an 
there was the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of, of Mother Earth, and it was held in Bolivia. So it's very much influenced by the, the, by the rights of nature approach that Bolivia and Ecuador bring forward. And the quote is, just as human beings have human rights, all other beings also have rights. And I've, uh, shall I tell you a little bit more about why I've selected it? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. So the quote is really, you know, talking about these new forms of rights, rights of nature, animal rights. And I think that would really, if we really consider that all beings have rights, that would really transform our relationship with nature and our relationship with with animals and I think because we are so yeah all human beings are so closely interrelated it if I think just if you want we if we want to really live in a in a sustainable way if we want future generations to be able to uh, to to live on this on this planet I think we need to redefine these these relationships and we we should consider rights uh, of nature and rights of of animals and i think the the court cases that we discussed earlier are a very nice example of how recognizing rights can lead to different decisions and to to different policies so that the language of rights can actually be quite strong and and quite transformative but environmental laws are also very often anthropocentric so i think we need we need these new rights of nature and animal rights approaches to yeah to 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 also find yeah to also create new policies and and find new alternative ways of living in a more more sustainable way yeah i really like that because i think even even just when you start to mobilize those ideas, your imagination starts to operate differently. What seems possible and not possible starts to open, like different opportunities open and, and different things are closed when you start to position other beings as being valid and important in policy. I think, you know, and this is where work like that of, of Sue Donaldson, Will Kimlicker, Josh Milburn, people that are kind of thinking through what would the future of our policies look like what do our future food systems look like what what do you know we have to start doing some of that work of imagining what these policies look like and how they would be in practice but we don't have to have that figured out perfectly and I think sometimes this is where people get tripped up everyone's like oh but what about the conflict and what if two different animals get into fires and everyone gives you all of these caveats which are important questions to have but I think just because we can't yet do it perfectly we don't do human rights perfectly by no measure but it doesn't stop us from acknowledging that human rights and and dignity are important and worth fighting for yeah definitely and there was a very long way from the universal declaration of human rights until now actually now we have a a human right to to a clean and healthy and sustainable environment so that's been a long way and there's been a shift really from thinking about individual civil and political rights to collected collective environmental rights so it's it's been a very long way until we have achieved that it was actually only last year that the right to healthy environment was recognized but it shows you that rights are dynamic and not static and that they actually rights are also shaped by the challenges that we face in the world and this means that i think we've we've come a very long way with human rights and now i think it's really the time to think beyond human rights and we've seen how human rights have changed over the decades and i think now is the time to to also extend basically that this rights language and also the recognition and the entitlement to to all living beings and it's really important to recognize that human rights have also never kind of stayed the same they have also developed and now is the time really for rights of nature and animal rights to develop fantastic and i think 
through that, you can almost, I know you said you kind of started out asking questions about, you know, you were looking at child rights and you started to think about questions with regards to the environment in Bangladesh. And it's interesting to kind of see how your own journey and this journey of how human rights and international relations have changed over time. But yeah, the rights are definitely dynamic and and we need to resist kind of thinking about them as this one size fits all thing. Even though it's a universal declaration, these these things change and there is a there is a dynamism to them. Andrea, what are you currently working on? And if people want to get in touch with you about something you've spoken about today or your work, how how can they do so? Yeah, so I'm currently working on rights of nature and animal rights, and I, I try to further develop this approach of you know procedure rights for nature and for for animals and how to actually put that into practice and at sterling we're also very closely working with environmental scientists or natural scientists who who have done similar things in 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 practice and but they don't always kind of use this rights language so this interdisciplinary collaboration here is really important and we're all learning quite a lot from it. And I'm also really uh, working on how rights can be strengthened in environmental agreements. So all forms of rights, human rights, animal rights and rights of nature and in which way local communities, but also other forms of actors, environmental actors can can strengthen uh, rights in, in international environmental agreements and if you want to get in touch, it's best via email. Yeah, and that's andrea.chopper at stir.ac.uk. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Your work sounds really interesting. I really love how animal studies has a way of being. I think it's inherently inter and transdisciplinary. You can't help but, I think, work with scholars across disciplines because it is just so complex and so so interesting, really. Thank you for your important work and for, for all of your time here today. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thanks for having me. Hello, Virginia. Welcome to the second last Animal Highlight. It's been a wonderful season so far. I've very much enjoyed listening to your highlights. Who, who are we talking about today? I know it's a very special one. Well, yeah, it is. I'm going to talk about the red kite today, and they're special because they're one of the animals that come up in my research. And the reason I'm looking at them is because I actually found it hard to find an animal for this highlight. You and Andrea Schaffer had such a broad and high-level discussion about the Sustainable Development Goals and global politics that I couldn't think of an animal whose story fit the topic perfectly. So I thought I'd talk about another of the animals from my own research, the red kite. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the story of the red kite's reintroduction to Britain. In many ways, this story fits with Andrea's definition of international relations as politics beyond borders. That's because as part of the reintroduction project, red kites were translocated to Britain from Germany, Spain and Sweden by Natural England, who are a public body, and the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, who are an NGO. And as I'll explain, Red kites are now travelling in the other direction and being translocated from Britain back to Spain. For listeners who don't know, red kites are a large bird of prey. They live throughout Europe and across into Western Asia and North Africa. One of the many things which makes red kites special is that they're incredibly distinctive. Even if you find it hard to recognise different types of birds, you can't miss a red kite. With their russet plumage, they're red in the way that we say foxes and squirrels are red. They have a forked tail like a swallow. And perhaps most distinctive of all, they have an incredible lofting flight. The kites that people fly get their name from red kites because of the graceful way these birds soar. In many ways, kites are an example of what we might call charismatic megafauna. They're large, distinctive, recognisable, and they elicit a strong response from people. But people haven't always appreciated red kites. In Tudor Britain, they were classified as vermin by the Preservation of Grain Act of 1532 because they were perceived to conflict with human interests. Bounties were paid for their killing and this led to widespread persecution. The development of game bird shooting intensified this persecution. Game bird shooting usually involves the captive rearing of birds like grouse, pheasants and partridges to be released and then shot, 
Gamekeepers were concerned that red kites were a threat to their young birds and therefore to game shooting, so they killed them. And things got even worse in the Victorian era. Because red kites were becoming scarce, they became a target for egg collectors and taxidermists. By the early 1900s, red kites had been wiped out in England and Scotland. A small population survived in Wales, but with only a few or possibly only one breeding pair. So in 1903, measures were put in place to protect them, in particular guarding their nests to protect them from egg collectors. Despite this, the red kite's rate of recovery was very slow. This was for a couple of reasons. First, the availability of food in the red kite's last stronghold in Wales was low. This made it hard for adults to feed and raise more than one chick at a time. Secondly, unlike most other raptors, kites are sociable. They're content to live with or near other kites. So as their population grows, they disperse only very slowly into new territories. So at this point, conservationists realised that without intervention, red kites would face a slow and even uncertain recovery. So they decided to intervene. And this is where international relations and global politics come in. In 1990, red kite chicks were taken from nests in Germany, Spain and Sweden and released in England and Scotland. This international conservation effort required cooperation between the British government and the governments in Germany, Spain and Sweden, together with the RSPB in Britain and their counterparts in the other countries. I think what this highlights most is that international collaboration is needed to conserve other than human species, especially species like the red kite who cross international borders, either as individuals when they're seeking food, mates or territories, or as a species, depending on where their range is. And since 1990, when the project to restore red kites to Britain began, red kites have flourished there and their numbers continue to rise. There are now thought to be around 10,000 red kites in Britain. Meanwhile, red kite numbers in Spain are falling because of persecution and a shortage of food. So now the tables have turned and red kite chicks are being translocated from Britain to Spain. As this shows, considering species at a global level has the potential to facilitate translocation projects like that of the red kite. International agreements like this can allow species to be moved across borders so as to conserve geographically separate populations and the species as a whole. The potential of international policy and action can, however, extend beyond thinking about animals and their conservation at species level. As Andrea suggests, we can also think about how international agreements and actions impact individual animals. A shift in focus from species to individual would require that attention is paid to how specific individuals are treated to achieve the overall goal of species conservation. This could include discussions about whether their rights to freedom and dignity are being infringed. As Andrea suggested, such discussions could perhaps be facilitated if there were a sustainable development goal dedicated to animal rights. Yeah, I know you started that out saying that you weren't too sure how to connect this to international relations and thinking about sustainable development goals. But I think there are so many layers to what you just said with regards to international relations, right? There's the relations between the various governments to make the red kite conservation projects work. There's also the mobility of the red kites, right? Their their capacity to themselves move across borders and also be assisted across borders. And I think really importantly, what you raised there at the end, the question though about species conservation versus individual rights, because I know that a lot of these translocation activities, I don't know if it's with red kites in particular, but I know with various species, translocation activities have been critiqued for their capacity to kind of seemingly pluck or rear specific animals for the conservation of a species without necessarily thinking about how those individuals are treated or potentially experience those those uh, efforts yeah the mortality rate in species translocations can be really high oh is that so huh yeah i i don't remember the figures but you know you really are putting these animals into an alien environment i remember one of your really early interviews talked about the cultures that animals have yeah, I think that was with Carl Safina quite a while ago. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what he was saying was 
you know, the culture of an animal in one place is not necessarily the same as the culture in another place. So dislocating, you know, translocating an animal is actually really dislocating. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting because I mean, then many people would make the arguments, like I know with red kites, you were speaking here about chicks, right? So there's this idea that if you remove an animal when they're really young, they'll they'll adapt to a new environment. And I have little doubt that that is the the case. You know, most animals, depending on their various niches and stuff, are adaptable, but that doesn't mean that there aren't problems with these practices that should be ironed out and thought about. And it's really tricky. I mean, this has come up in our conversations a whole bunch. Is you know, I do think conservationists care and they want to change the world and they see a massive problem that they're trying to address. But sometimes there's also a need for more nuance with thinking about individuals. And sometimes talking about individuals can get really, it can be a thorn in the side of a species level conversation, right? Where where you have what seems to be a really easy answer to something just all of a sudden becomes really messy and complicated. And I don't know if that's always, I don't know if the mess is always appreciated, right? Like then maybe we, nothing gets done. Well, well, it's such a trade-off, isn't it? That's the trouble. You know, if you, if you're concerned about individuals, then yeah, absolutely. Translocation is arguably not the right thing for that individual. But if you're concerned about species level conservation, then, then it is the right thing. Yeah. I always try to think about myself, like if someone blindfolded me and just dumped me in the middle of like a random field somewhere, (laughs) and I I was like, oh, even in a random city in a language I didn't speak, you know, I, I would probably adapt, but it would probably be a really jarring experience. I know I did a walking tour and, and I think obviously these translocation activities have gotten better and better with time but I remember doing a historical walking to a stop with regards to a bear and the use of bears at Queen's University as mascots and these bears were literally being plucked so these were little black bears and they were literally being plucked from Algonquin Park as cubs used as mascots at the university and then when the students kind of got tired of them they just randomly dumped them somewhere else in a forest. They were like, they'll be fine. But these were cubs that had now become quite habituated to humans. We're used to eating candy and sweets and being paraded through. And then just this idea that you can just dump them in the middle of a forest somewhere and they'll be fine, you know, it, it kind of speaks to this idea that they're, they're just automatons, right? Like they, they're the same. A bear is a bear is a bear. A red kite is a red kite is a red kite. But I think more and more research is just showing that that's, that's not the case. Individuals have individual preferences, have individual, like, attached to specific cultures. But yeah, this, anyway, I think this animal highlight was really, really fascinating. And I, I really appreciated Andrea's suggestion of, of animals being better incorporated into SDGs. I think it's much needed. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea because she's absolutely right. You know, they're they're there in the background in life on land and life underwater, but they're not front and center. And I and I fear that even in life on land and life in the water, it's operating at the species level we've been talking about, or it's operating at just this kind of abstract idea of nature. So often animals are co-opted into the idea. I mean, we're all part of nature, but what does it mean when you say you know, we want to preserve nature. Like, what does that actually mean? Like, which relationships are we talking about? Which, you know, individuals and places and cultures are we talking about here? When you start to get into those details, it becomes complicated. So having an international organization that can help wade through those conflicts and those complexities is a a brilliant idea, I think. All right, well, Virginia, thank you so much for your work with Animal Highlights, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you at the Grad Review. Thank you so much to Andrea for being a fantastic guest, to Jeremy John for the logo and Gordon Clark for the bed music. Thank you to Rebecca Shen for her design work with the social media posts, and a huge thank you to Christian Mentz for his editing work. This is The Animal Tone with me, Claudia Hurtenfelder. Thank you.
For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Oh.